Mediterranean. She's excavated on the islands of Crete, Cyprus, and in Greece, and also in Egypt. She began her career at the University of Wisconsin, where she received a BA in archaeology and anthropology in 1972. She and I were office mates at the University of Minnesota during the 1970s, where she pursued the program in ancient studies, and I pursued literary matters, and also worried about our classes and our students and whether we would ever get jobs. Um, Julie has done some very, very important work on uh, the plant remains and the history of botanical remains in the Eastern Mediterranean. Did most of her work um, at the beginning of her career at Franfi Cave in Greece and has completed a work on the paleoethnobotany of Franfi Cave. She's now engaged in a second book project called The Archaeology of Plants, which is a larger work. I think that's all I'd like to say by way of preamble, except that everyone on this side of the room will probably enjoy what they see more if they move to the I other side. Yeah. They don't want to move. They want to stay. Okay. After much ado, we're ready to start. If I don't trip over a cord now. I am delighted to be here to address this diverse uh, group of people and uh, very grateful to Madeline and the others who have worked so hard over the past. Madeline and I started talking about this about two years ago, so it's been a long time in coming. Um, I'm also very delighted, I have to say, to be back in the Midwest where I grew up and went to school. Um, the East Coast has nothing on the Midwest as far as I'm concerned, except for fish. But never mind. Tonight I want to talk to you about the origins of agriculture in the Eastern Mediterranean, primarily in the Near East, um, principally the Near Eastern area I'm going to be talking about is the Levant uh, up here, Israel, Jordan, Syria, um, primarily. I will mention some of the um, areas in eastern Iraq and the Zagros Mountains as well. Um, but the, the most important areas for the origins of cereal and legume agriculture, which is really the subject of my talk, is right along this area up in the, the Tauros Mountains here between uh, in, in southern Turkey, northern Syria, and along the Levantine coast here, the Jordan, Rift Valley, etc. Okay. Now, most people, when I tell them I'm a paleoethnobotanist, sort of give me a blank stare and change the subject. Um, so I'd like to first of all start by telling you a little bit about what it is I do and how we study the problems like the origins of agriculture uh, in the discipline of archaeology, which is really a, a multidisciplinary discipline now. Um, plant remains uh, are preserved on archaeological sites in a number of different ways. The principal material that I deal with, the principal kind of preservation in this part of the world is by carbonization. The plant remains principally seeds, um, wood, and other very dense parts of the plants have been burned to the point where they haven't turned to ash, they're not completely burned, but they've turned to little lumps of carbon primarily, and just like little pieces of charcoal. If the burning process is um, not too severe, not too rapid, the seeds will not be too badly distorted, so you can identify a wheat seed as a wheat seed or a barley seed as a barley seed. And anybody in here who's ever looked at wheat and barley seeds, and I imagine there must be some of you in here from this campus, um, will know that there is a difference. There's a morphological difference between the two. They, they actually do have different shapes, different sizes, different characteristics. Okay, so when I collect this material from an archaeological site, and we do this by dumping the dirt that we excavate into water. The carbonized material floats on the surface of the water, and we can collect it in, in large quantities if it, it happens to be there in large quantities. And uh, once it's dried, I sort through it with a microscope. And I compare the seeds that I find and the wood charcoal that I find with modern comparative material, modern examples of these different species that we're finding in order to identify them. We can't always identify everything to the species level. I should emphasize that. 
Um, we're getting better and better at it with more and more um, different kinds of techniques. We're getting into chemical techniques, which I will briefly mention tonight, um, to distinguish one species from another. We use scanning electron microscopes in some cases to look at minute details, little tiny bumps and things on the surface of the seeds uh, to help us identify them to the species level. Um, more often than not, however, there's enough distortion or enough significant parts of the plant are missing and very often plants are identified by their flowers and their leaves as opposed to their seeds that at a species level it, it might be very difficult or impossible to identify some of these little black blobs as I will show you tonight. They're not pretty things. We're not talking about gold and pretty pots. Uh, we're talking about little black blobs basically. Um, to me they're beautiful and beauty is in the eye of the beholder and I hope to, to instill a little bit of interest in you tonight uh, in this kind of topic and give you a little bit of insight into how archaeologists and botanists have been working together over the years to solve one of, uh, one of the greatest um, events, really, uh, or processes, perhaps is a more appropriate word, uh, in human history, and that's the origins of agriculture. So to start out, could I have the lights, please, Madeline? To start out, we have, as you now have been staring at these for five minutes, you know what these are, uh, we have the, um, the geography of the, of, of the Near East here, Turkey um, and the Levant. Um, the Tauros Mountains here are important. Mountain ranges along the Levantine coast, uh, as you will see, become important in the process, uh, in the ecology of these plants. Uh, and as we get further south here now, we get into the Negev Desert, the Sinai, etc. The slide on your uh, left here, on your right, beg your pardon, is um, a uh, depiction of the modern vegetational zones in this area. Uh, and I put this up here just to give you an idea of the complexity of the vegetational zones in this part of the world. It's important, obviously, if we're going to study plants and the development of plants and changes in plants, we need to know something of their habitats, their ecology. Um, and it's a difficult problem in this part of the world, first of all, just because of its vastness in area, but also because of the mountain ranges, um, the large, vast plains, uh, high plateaus, etc. It provides a very diverse um, kind of topography for the different plant, uh, plant life there. So in order to, this is the modern vegetation, which we can look at today, and it's, it's there. We go out there and we say, OK, this is what is growing here. This is a steppe. This is a desert. This is a forest, um, and identify the plants. But we want to now translate this back into prehistory, OK? And I want to talk to you a little bit about how that is done as well tonight, because it becomes important in understanding how we know about uh, where the plants existed that were ultimately um, one other little bit of preamble here, uh, definitions. It's very important to understand what I mean by domesticated versus wild plants. Now, the species I'm going to be talking about tonight, um, domesticated wheat and barley and various legumes, um, are domesticated because they have undergone a genetic change. Um, oftentimes, this is only a single point on a chromosome that mutates uh, it, and causes the dispersal mechanism of the wild plant to change so that the plant can't disperse its seeds when it's ripe. Wild plants have this ability, obviously, or, or they would never be able to, to propagate. Um, domesticated plants, by definition, have lost this property. They need human intervention, someone to take the seeds and stick them into the ground because the plants, for the most part, can't do that themselves. And the genetic changes that um, plants have undergone are what the botanists have been studying for uh, a long time now. And um, in addition to the changes in the dispersal mechanism, there are also certain morphological changes in the seeds themselves that take place, which allow us to distinguish then a seed of a wild wheat, for example, from the seed of a, of a domesticated wheat. Okay, 
Um, there are other parts of the plants as well that we study. I, I, I don't want to get into too much detail on that tonight. Um, what I'm mainly interested in, in is conveying to you the, the cooperation that has been going on over the years between archaeologists and botanists in studying this, um, this problem. Um, the whole uh, problem of the origins of agriculture has been discussed for um, about 150 years now um, by, by botanists primarily in the early years, um, including um, uh, De Candolle from, from France, who published treatises back in the 1850s, um, uh, Nikolai Vavilov, a Russian um, botanist, um, did a, a tremendous study looking at where the wild species of plants that were ultimately domesticated exist naturally or existed during his time. They still exist in some cases in these areas today. Uh, and he identified um, in a, in a um, treatise he, he published in the early 20th century um, for the Near East, the plants, wheat, barley, lentils, etc. He identified the Near East in general, this part of the Near East, as a center for domestication. Okay, this is early 20th century we're talking about here. Um, but his studies of the ecology of these plants, the habitats of these wild predecessors that still can be found in these areas today, uh, led him to conclude and others to agree with him that, that this was one of the centers for domestication. Um, there are other centers around the world for other plants, obviously um, plants like corn, um, or tomatoes domesticated in the New World, um, rice, uh, etc., dom domesticated in the Far East. So um, domestication of plants, this whole process, didn't take place just once and then spread out from, from a center. It took place in a number of different places around the world with different plants um, and may have spread from those centers out uh, in, a, in a smaller region. So we've been studying this, plant, this problem of the origins of agriculture, botanists looking at what the progenitors were of these wild, of these domesticated plants um, and where they existed um, since, since the middle of the 19th century. Archaeologists began to address this question as well early in the 20th century um, with, um, let's see if I can get these work. Hang on a minute. Um, people like um, V. Gordon Child, as you see here, with his teddy bear, um, who, who is best known for um, promoting an idea, which in fact was not his own, but had already been published earlier by someone else, the idea that agriculture began at the end of the last ice age, at the end of the Pleistocene, uh, as a result of uh, a drought that, that the, um, the, the earth, the, the rainfall decreased to such an extent that there was a massive drought in um, Southwest Asia. And this resulted in people congregating around water holes and oases. It's, it's commonly known as the oasis theory. Um, and that the, the, the juxtaposition of the people the wild plants and wild animals um, resulted in people becoming more, more familiar with the way these animals and plants um, reproduced and ultimately tamed the animals, bred the animals, domesticated them, and domesticated the plants as well. This is the oasis theory or propinquity theory that became quite popular um, uh, in archaeology uh, and was, was sort of a, a an accepted theory for, for many, many years. And um, with, agri with archaeological research in the Near East that was taking place early on with, with a number of sites like Ur, which unfortunately isn't on this map, but it's right down here, um, and various other sites like Jericho, for example, uh, being excavated, where they were finding early Neolithic occupation, um, very early civilizations, earlier than had been found before, um, it would it began to appear as if child might have been right. They didn't have the environmental data to go along with this. The archaeologists were, were merely excavating sites and, and building up pictures of cultures. 
but it appeared that there were some significant things going on here um, in, in the Near East in, in the early Neolithic period, about 8,000 years or so ago. Okay. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, um, archaeologists from the University of Chicago, uh, Robert Braidwood uh, leading them, went off to actually test this theory, this oasis theory, to find out if in fact it was true. And this really began the intensive research into the origins of agriculture in the Near East, uh, bringing together archaeology and, and botany. Um, Braidwood went off to the Zagros Mountains here and excavated a number of sites, the important one being here at Ali Kash, uh, a cave site that uh, had uh, a number of layers of occupation. Um, this is the area that he was, uh, he was digging in. This is the Zagros Mountains here, and the foothills of these mountains is where, uh, where the site of Ali Kash is. Okay, it's ab above the, um, the plain of, uh, of the Euphrates and Tigris River. Um, what Braidwood discovered at Ali Kash was, in fact, that there were domesticated wheat and barley there, emmer wheat and um, two-row barley, and domesticated animals, domesticated sheep and goat, um, fairly early on. The dates he was getting from this site were about um, 9,000 years ago, between 9,000 and 8,500 years ago. Uh, and this was a significant find. But in addition to finding the plants and animals on these sites, he brought along um, pa palynologists, people who study um, environmental change through looking at the changes in pollen sequences through time by doing cores and uh, in lake beds, etc., and building up a picture of changes in vegetation through time. And um, amongst the, the palynologists that went out here, various people from the Netherlands, Willem van Zeist, etc., um, Herb Wright from the University of Minnesota, um, various people had, have done um, pollen studies in this area uh, over the years. And it's primarily as a direct result of, of Braidwood's initial work here that um, we have as much pollen study done, this one doesn't work, as we, as we do. This is a pollen core that was done up in the Zagros Mountains. Uh, and this is, this is what it looks like when it's all done. This is, these are the data that they, that they produce. And each one of these columns here, this very wide one here and all of these little narrow ones, represent changes in the percentage of pollen of particular species of trees through time. Starting down here, the date down here is about 21,000 years ago. And the date up at the top, this would be the modern level, the most recent pollen deposited in this particular lake bed. Okay, And so this diagram here represents changes in the percentage of oak trees in the region. Um, from almost no oak, this is at the end of the last ice age, conditions being very cold, very dry, uh, unfavorable for the growth of trees. Um, the end of the ice age, uh, right about here, and warmer, wetter conditions and expansion of oak forest in the Zagros Mountains. Okay. Um, another important part of this diagram is this one over here, which represents the non-woody plants, the non-arboreal plants, grasses, and other herbaceous vegetation. And we can see that in the late Pleistocene here, at the end of the last ice age, we have um, predominance of herbaceous vegetation plants adapted to these very cold, dry conditions. Um, and then as, as the temperatures warm up, as rainfall increases, the, these plants retreat uh, as the forest expands. Okay, so there's a, obviously a connection between these two things and all connected with environment. So it's these kinds of studies, these pollen studies by the botanists, palynologists, coinciding with, uh, coming along with the studies by archaeologists in these areas that ultimately resulted in the kinds of answers we now have to the question of when and where and how and why did agriculture first begin. And that, uh, to make a long story short, is what I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, now, 
in, in all of these pollen diagrams, this one is not working. There we go. Okay. Um, the pollen diagrams like the one that I just showed you and all of the other ones that were on the previous, uh, the previous map, um, the palynologists have been able to put together rough, and these are very rough, uh, vegetation maps of the region through time. This is one dated to the very end of the Pleistocene, the very end of the, of the glacial period, where we have um, predominance of what is called forest steppe or steppe along the coast and up uh, around the Anatolian Plateau. This is open forest and um, with few trees and, and mostly herbaceous vegetation. Um, and a lot of area, for those areas where we have pollen data, um, of predominantly just steppe or, or in the south here, um, desert or desert steppe. Okay, so um, a, a relatively um, sparse vegetation in, in this part, especially in the Levant here, we have a little bit of, of forested area in the southern Levant at this time, but mostly it's, it's very open forest at most, and that would be up in the mountains where, we, where the rainfall was greater, um, and then forest step and, uh, and step in this area. This is the area we're going to be talking about primarily for, for the rest of the evening. Uh, we don't have many pollen diagrams any pollen diagrams for this particular area here in northern Syria, except one from right over about here. Uh, and it should be noted that pollen data is, is regional, but only regional within uh, a, a hundred kilometers or so around the area where the pollen was taken from. So we can't expand these kind of data to, a, to, to say, well, all of the Near East look like this. It's only um, those areas around the sites where the pollen was, was recovered. Okay, I'm trying to remember which slide is which here. Nope, that was wrong one. I had a 50-50 chance. Okay, um, what archaeologists then, working, continuing to work in this area, have discovered is that in addition to the early Neolithic sites with early um, domesticated plants, beneath those sites are layers that contain pre-Neolithic occupation. And um, studies done, surveys now that have been carried out throughout the Levant um, have shown that, that the amount of pre-Neolithic occupation in this area, the period covering roughly 12,000 to 11,000 years ago, um, 12,000 to, to 10,000 years ago actually, um, was a period of fairly dense habitation in this part of the world when the forests were beginning to expand at the, at the end of the Pleistocene, um, it was getting warmer and wetter. The um, deer population, gazelle populations that lived in these environments were expanding and populations were expanding as well. All of the botanical resources these people could exploit were expanding with the expansion of the forest. Um, amongst the sites where we see this kind of progression, um, an expansion is the site of Jericho here. Here's the mound, uh, the south side of the mound of Jericho uh, here with a big excavation trench in it. This was done by Kathleen Kenyon back in the, in the 50s here. And um, Jericho, of course, is a site that was occupied for thousands of years, which is why we have this great buildup of sediment here. The lowest layers, amongst the lowest layers, we have this kind of deposit here, these are mesolithic layers, pre-neolithic layers, layers deposited, living floors deposited by people who were hunters and gatherers, hunting wild animals, primarily gazelle in this area, and collecting wild plants. Um, at Jericho, in particular, we don't have any wild plants preserved in these levels, unfortunately, but we do have other sites uh, dated to the same time period where we do have um, plant remains. In addition to plant remains, and I'll talk about those in a second, we also have the, um, the tools that people used to process those plant remains, which gives us a little bit of a clue as to, um, as to what they might have been using. Uh, tools like this, big grinding stones, appear at this time in the Mesolithic. Um, these are typically used 
uh, and, and continued to be used right through the Neolithic and, and onward for grinding grain, making flour or, or pounding grain to make uh, bulgur or couscous, that type of thing. Um, this is a husking tray here, um, actually uh, a wooden one, which is preserved, carbonized, um, very unusual find, a scored bowl of wood, and they would put the grain in there and shake it around and, and husk it or, or thresh it. Um, to remove the husk. The wild grains have, have, are tightly enclosed in the husk and uh, in the early domesticated form are tightly enclosed in the husk as well. So you, you need these kinds of processing tools. Uh, other kinds of tools, the most important ones here are, are things like this, long blades, especially these types of tools, which are um, called sickle blades uh, that were hafted onto handles uh, not, uh, this is not a, not a handle, but it might have looked like this, in fact, with a slit down one side and these blades stuck in there, um, being stuck in with a bitumen uh, of some sort. Uh, and those kinds of things have actually been found on some sites um, and used as a sickle to cut the grain. Okay. Uh, in other cases, the grain might have been beaten into baskets with a stick because the grain, the wild grain, comes off the head very easily as it ripens uh, and would have shattered into, into baskets quite easily. Okay, so these are some of the, some of the tool types that we find at this pre-Neolithic, this is hunting and gathering period. And some of the plant remains we find are things like um, wild pistachio. This is a modern growing wild pistachio plant, not to be confused with the domesticated pistachio nuts that they dye pink and cover with salt. Um, these are carbonized nutlets of wild pistachio. That's what they look like. Uh, these particular plants come from Francfi. I don't have examples from, from the Near East itself, but they're the same. They look the same. Um, and just to give you, uh, give you an example of what, what the difference is, people always ask me, well, what do, what do wild pistachios look like? Um, there are modern pistachios, you're all familiar with those. These are the wild ones. Uh, they taste like turpentine. And uh, they're still used today. They're, you can buy bags of them roasted in the markets in Cyprus. And um, they, are, they are typically added to meat dishes, um, various different kinds of sausages, etc. cetera. So um, they are still utilized today. And the pistachio bush, the number of different species have different uses of, of various kinds. They, they produce a a gummy substance, one of the species does, that is used as chewing gum, or they use, use it to fill cavities, various things. Uh, it has a wide variety of, it's all-purpose plant. Um, so those are the, the wild pistachios. Um, uh, other kinds of plants that are found, and remember the forest is expanding here, we're getting more um, trees in here, wild pears. These again are from Francfi, but the same plants are found in the Near East. This is a whole carbonized wild pear here, and, and then the, the seeds of the plant as well have been found. And perhaps one of the more important plants along with the cereals are wild legumes, and lentils um, are amongst the earliest legumes uh, and the most predominant legumes that are, that are utilized by these people. And those are some examples. I told you these weren't pretty, okay? Um, but they're, uh, they're at least identifiable. Um, now, uh, this is an example of some of the cereals that have been found. These actually were found on a, on a Mesolithic site in the Near East, uh, the site of Abu Reira, which I will be mentioning a number of times tonight. It's probably the most important site so far excavated to talk about the origins of agriculture in the Near East because uh, of the quantity and quality of the plant remains preserved on this site from these Mesolithic levels and then subsequently from Neolithic levels. So we have uh, in one site both um, the wild and the domesticated plants showing up. These are, uh, or at least were initially identified as wild einkorn wheat, and one of the one of the primary species of wheat that was first domesticated. Um, and they're very common in um, Near Eastern sites where we have Mesolithic plant remains preserved. They're native to the area. 
Uh, most recently, um, the archaeologist Gordon Hillman from um, the Institute of Archaeology in London, who's been studying these plants, has gotten together with the chemists. We've had botanists coming together with archaeologists. We now have chemists coming together to um, help identify some of these seeds, which he was not sure were einkorn. And he thought maybe they were wild rye, because he has domesticated rye in the Neolithic levels. And yet he hadn't found many grains of wild rye in the Mesolithic levels. So they, they discovered that you could take a single grain of, the, of this material here, one of these grains, and process it and remove uh, vestiges of the fatty acids that are preserved. Even a carbonized seed that's 10,000 years old, there's enough remains of fatty acids in there that they could analyze those and identify the, the type of fatty acid, the quantity of the different types of fatty acid in it, and identify that to a particular species of wheat, in this case, or rye. Okay, And this is the kind of graph they would get out. They did this with a technique called uh, infrared spectroscopy. You don't need to remember that. There won't be a quiz. Um, but they, they ended up with a graph, graphs like these. These are modern um, seeds of uh, wild rye here. And this is the graph for the, for the seeds from the site of Avareira. And they're, they're virtually the same. Okay, The graphs for the einkorn are quite different. I don't happen to have pictures of those. Take my word for it. They are quite different. Um, and uh, from a, a nearby site uh, that is um, a slightly later site uh, near Abu Reira, we have um, domesticated, um, a, uh, not, this is not domesticated, but a different species of wild mm -hmm. rye. Here's that um, species here, uh, the modern graph, and here's the the, the graph from the ancient species. So even, um, even minute traces of, uh, of chemicals um, in these seeds can, are now being analyzed. And this is a process that we could use for, for all of those problem seeds where we can't tell one species from another. And there are many of those. Okay. Um, this is just an example here of the um, the wild rye plant that would have been growing um, in the area uh, today. Uh, this right here. And just to, to clue you into what the sites I'm talking about, Abu Reira is there in northern Syria, right on the Euphrates River. Um, the other side of Morabit uh, is right there. Uh, Abu Reira dates from about 11,000 to um, 10,000 BC, BP in these early, uh, uh, early levels, Mesolithic levels. Um, to orient you, Jericho is down there. Okay. Important sites during this period, um, Mesolithic period spread throughout this whole area, even down into, into the south, into the Negev Desert um, in the Mesolithic period. So there was uh, intensive occupation, increase in population, and apparently sedentary occupation. And this is very important. It was an important step in the process of the origins of agriculture that these people moved from being mobile, small bands of hunters and gatherers, um, following herds of gazelle, perhaps, um, and collecting wild plants where they could find them, as they must have done throughout the Pleistocene. Um, to this period when we're getting uh, warmer, wetter conditions, increasing um, forested areas and more lush vegetation, increase in these various wild resources, um, and an, an expansion of, of population in settled communities building houses and staying in the same place year round. That process, this settling, settling down, um, eliminated to a large extent all of the different taboos that people tend to have when they're mobile populations, uh, which allowed them then to increase the population. All of the taboos that go along with um, keeping the population low and keeping a low birth, weight, birth rate were, um, were disbanded with because they, they were now in areas with good resources that they could exploit throughout the year, so they didn't have to be mobile anymore. So um, to give you an idea of the kinds of areas that these people were expanding into, um, let me just take you down 
the, down the Levant, we're moving down the, the Orontes Valley, which basically travels down here and then down the Jordan Valley, down the Dead Sea and into the, into the, Negev, uh, into the Negev Desert. Um, we have the Orontes uh, Valley up here in, um, in Lebanon. And it was this kind of area and the foothills of these areas where we were getting the expansion of this forest. Okay, so you just have to imagine that there's more plants there than you actually see. It's hard to imagine that in some of these pictures, of course, because there are no plants in some of these pictures today. Uh, obviously, these areas uh, have been heavily worked over, um, both by uh, farmers and herders, uh, intensively cultivating and, um, and then grazing their flocks in these areas. Um, and that, along with various climatic changes, et cetera, has resulted in in massive deforestation over the thousands of years since the end of the Pleistocene and, um, and massive erosion so that the hills that once held all of the sediment you see here um, now are bare or, or nearly bare. Um, and all of the sediment has eroded down, been carried down by the rivers and, and deposited on the floodplains. Okay, so here we are, um, the southern um, Jordan Valley here, the, the Dead Sea, uh, the Dead Sea here, we're at the edge of the Dead Sea and moving down uh, south um, in, the, uh, in the Jordan Valley and onto the, into the Negev Desert, uh, where they can, with irrigation, just on the edge of the desert, they can uh, cultivate, but then we get into very barren um, sand dunes, wasteland, scrub vegetation, stepic vegetation in, in some cases. Okay, now in order to trace the changes in this vegetation through time, as we get into this period when we first begin to see domesticated plants, we want to know what was going on with the vegetation. What, where were these plants and how was the climate and the environment changing and did that have an effect, as child had thought, did that have an effect on the process of domestication? And for a long time, um, as a result of, of the studies done by Braidwood's team in the Zagros Mountains and all of these other pollen diagram studies done in the Near East, it looked as if there wasn't a drought at the end of the Pleistocene. We didn't have this whole um, drying up and people gathering around oases and, and domesticating the plants and animals that were in the area. Um, so that theory was, was pretty much thrown out and archaeologists went after other types of theories. The whole idea of population expansion um, is one of those theories that they settled uh, permanently and population expanded to the extent that they, um, they overexploited the area that they had to exploit around their settlement and then were forced because of this overexploitation to artificially increase the plants that they had by deliberately cultivating them, assuming, of course, that they knew how to cultivate. They knew that you had to take the seed and stick it into the ground in order for you to get a new crop. Um, so population expansion, um, overpopulation, it has been a, a prominent theory in the origins of agriculture for a long time. Uh, and various spin-offs and, and convolutions of that theory have been developed and disbanded over the years. Um, in, in most recent study, in the, a study that's been published only in the last year, um, new pollen data from Lake Hule, which is in, is in northern, uh, northern Jordan Valley, um, this is an old diagram, but a new diagram um, covering the same time period has shown that indeed there was probably a period of about a thousand years between 11,000 and 10,000 years ago when there was a period of drought. And we can just see this on this diagram right here. It may not look like much to you, but this is a period where we had, at the end of the Pleistocene, you get the expanding trees here. These are um, deciduous um, oak trees for the most part, expanding, increasing in quantity. And then we've got this little blip. We've got another little blip there. 
uh, with several little blips here. Uh, this represents probably uh, a period of drought. Um, it's difficult to say that from this diagram, I admit, but the other diagram, which I didn't have a copy of uh, to, to photograph, um, shows this much more clearly because it has a much dated, much better dated um, section right there. So between 11,000 and 10,000, we now have paleontological evidence for this part of, of the Near East that there probably was a drought. Now, the effect of that is seen in the plant remains from this site of Abu Reira that I have already mentioned. Um, prior to this period, the plants that they were getting were of these things like pistachios and pears and the various cereals that I've mentioned, along with a very wide variety of plants from not only the steppe, but the, but the, 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 river, um, the river vegetation and up into the foothills where you get forest and, and forest steppe areas with a, quite a diverse uh, number of plants. Um, with, um, with this drought, at this period in time on this site, a lot of those pistachios and, and pears and a lot of that woody vegetation that they had been exploiting uh, decreases. And all the steppic species, species that they were exploiting, the species that grow in drier conditions, um, begin to increase. And this goes along with this kind of pollen data. Uh, and in the gob, the pollen diagram from up near the site of Abu Reis, this is about 150 kilometers away from the site itself, we have um, this period right in here. Okay, here we have the end of the Pleistocene uh, with increasing trees, and then we have this sharp decrease right here. Okay, and that represents a period of time when we have this drought. Okay, I think I pointed the wrong one. It's right here, sorry. This <coughs> increase in trees, zone Z, is what they are, are equating with this period from about 1,000 years, 11,000 to 10,000 years ago, when we have this drought. Um, so we have, we have data both from the pollen evidence and from the plant remains from the archaeological site that begin to corroborate one another and also then begin to corroborate um, the original idea that there was a drought at the end of the Pleistocene that, that might have resulted in the domestication of plants. Um, now, the effect of this drought would have been an increase in this kind of vegetation. Not these vegetation, but this vegetation. Um, steppic vegetation. This is, this is pretty degraded steppe here. This is almost desert. Um, but very uh, low-growing, scrubby vegetation, a little lusher than this, um, expanded now at this period. And so the, 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 the number of trees uh, available and the resources in these forests that they had been exploiting disappeared. Um, it's, it's as these step and, and, and forest step areas expand, this drier vegetation area expands and the deciduous forest decreases that we, we begin to see the change. First of all, remember we had sedentary populations um, and expanding populations at this time. Every site that has this Mesolithic occupation is abandoned at this period of time, okay? I don't, we don't know where they went. Um, we're still looking for those sites that have people in them at this point in time. Um, but all of these sites were, were abandoned at the end of this, uh, of this period for uh, several hundred years, all right? Not a very long period of time. And then they were reoccupied. Jericho was abandoned. Abu Reira was abandoned. Several of the other big sites um, that we see at this time period were abandoned. And when they're reoccupied, they have domesticated plants. So they went off someplace and domesticated plants and then came back with them. And we're still wondering quite where, where would they have gone? Well, one way to figure out where they would have gone is to follow where the forest went and where the, the ecotone between the forest step and the step went. Where did that move to? Because that's where these plants, the domesticated plants, or the wild progenitors of the domesticated plants, would have gone. Okay. Um, just to run through very briefly the kinds of plants that were domesticated, this is um, wild einkorn wheat here, one of, the, one of the primary wheat species that was domesticated. This is uh, what the domesticated uh, einkorn wheat uh, 
looks like. The shape of the seed is different. I don't know if you can see that uh, from, from where you're sitting, but um, there, there's a distinct difference in, in the shape of the seed, so we can tell when we have domesticated um, species. Um, now, where were those plants? Well, this is the natural, modern distribution of wild einkorn, um, predominantly in this area here, okay, um, on the Anatolian Plateau, um, around the foothills of the Zagros and the Tauros Mountains, and then vestiges of them today uh, are represented by all these dots. These may be um, sagittal habitats. Uh, they may not be actually um, areas where the plant was native, but has, has since has been introduced, um, perhaps in prehistoric times, but may not be part of their natural distribution. Okay, so this is one area where we have um, the, the wild plant existing in modern times. Um, their distribution in ancient times may have been broader than this. We have to remember the amount of, of um, environmental destruction that has gone on over the years. So um, we're not looking at its maximum extent necessarily. Okay. Um, but that, that arc, that Zagros Toros arc becomes important. Here's the um, wild rye slash einkorn from Amarera that I mentioned before. And these are the domesticated seeds that show up in the site uh, in the Neolithic period, just to give you an idea of the difference. Which, what we see as paleoethnic botanists, this is what we're looking at, and the difference in these two. Okay. Um, oh, that's not that one. Things to have happened um, is that we went from sedentary foragers hunting and gathering these wild plants and animals, increase in population size, and then we had in conjunction with that, a period of drought and a decrease, not only as a result of overexploitation, but a decrease as a result of the climatic change now, um, to the abandonment of most of these sites. These people probably went off following those, um, those resources that they had been utilizing, um, and, and then resettled in, in sites that we have not yet uh, found and cult began cultivating. And they had all the tools, they knew how to do it, um, and, and began the cultivation to artificially increase the food resources that they had. Uh, and this is what ultimately resulted in the domestication of the plants. Um, now there's, um, there are a couple of different steps that they needed to go through in order to do this. One can't just walk into a field and, and cut, the, cut the plants down and plant those wild plants and expect to get domesticated plants. That won't work. Um, you need, you need a, a mutation here, which occurs naturally in the wild stand, but you need to, to select for that mutation. You need to select those plants that already have this domesticated characteristic. And in order to do that, you need to cut the plants in a certain way so that you don't shake um, so that you don't, uh, so that you're selecting for this, this, this uh, domesticated type. The domesticated type, remember, is the type that doesn't fall apart when it ripens. It doesn't propagate its seeds. The seed head remains as a whole head. And um, one way to, to select for this is to take one of those sickles made from those little blade tools and grab a bunch of the plants by the heads and cut them. And this will select for those heads that remain intact when you, when you do that process. Um, if you go through the, through the plants and beat them to collect the seed, um, you will merely collect all of those that naturally shatter the wild type. And if you plant those, you plant wild type, you get another field of wild type, and you can go on doing that forever. And you'll never get a domesticated field. If you take these sickles and cut them in this way, and then select for those domesticated, those mutant plants is what you're collecting here. You're collecting a bunch of mutants. Um, or at least a proportion of your crop that you're collecting there is, is mutated. You then subsequently plant those in an area where the wild plants aren't growing. Because you don't want all those wild seeds growing in, the, in your field. 
Um, you clear a new area where those wild plants aren't growing, and then you sow that field with your specially selected plants that you cut, especially with your sickle. Um, you are selecting for these domesticated types, and you will, um, it, is, it is estimated within the space of about 20 years, produce a fully domesticated field, a, a field of fully domesticated cereals. So this whole process of domestication, going from a wild stand to a fully domesticated field, probably took place in as little as a, as a human generation. Um, this is something we're never going to see archaeologically. Uh, that level, that fine-tuning uh, of, of chronology, we will never be able to identify archaeologically, which is one reason why we don't see these sites where we move from wild plants to domesticated plants. Not only were, were most of the big sites we've found so far unexcavated, and precious few of these sites have been excavated, I should emphasize that, um, but we don't we won't see this kind of, of change taking place, okay? It's go when the change takes place, it's going to be very rapid, very abrupt, if we ever do find a site where this happens. And it might not even be recognized um, as, as this kind of change um, in such short, such short a time. So that's one of the, one of the problems in, a, in, in addressing this question. But that appears to be how the process must have taken place. There are certain steps that these people had to have learned or, or, or reached, and we know that they had the tool types, uh, we know that they had the wild cereals, and um, it appears that they had the other kinds of conditions, including the need to increase their food resources because the population was getting too large, uh, and the food resources were decreasing um, because of climatic fluctuation that forced them into this, into this process to artificially increase their their crops. Uh, all of this took place sometime around 10,000 years ago. And by 10,000 to 9,700 years ago, these sites like Jericho, like Abu Reira, and others that have been excavated um, are reoccupied now with a fully domesticated um, assemblage of domesticated species. Um, and, and they carry on Neolithic uh, Neolithic life and expand once again um, and until they reach maximum uh, carrying capacity of the of the land and then again sometime around 8500 years ago we see another collapse in the Levant um, possibly again a conjunction with a climatic fluctuation but it appears at this point the introduction of the sheep and goat into this area resulted in in, in massive devastation of um, some of the natural vegetation, which resulted in erosion. Um, and then that combined with increasing cultivation, um, deforestation to, um, for the purposes of, of building, because they had all these houses to build. All of these destructive processes, the kinds of things that we're talking about now in the tropical forests that, were, that we continue to do, people were doing 10,000 years ago in the Near East. And we see the effects of this. And population expansion. Um, and sites increase, site size increases, complexity of site increases until about 8,500 years ago, and then wham, everything collapses, and there are whole areas of the, of the Near East that are totally abandoned for, for um, uh, several hundred years again. Um, now, that particular event, 8,500 years or so ago, is what probably was one of the um, the kicks that resulted in, ex in, in expansion of population outside of the Near East. Um, this is a, one of the problems that, uh, that I have been looking at um, in, with respect to the um, introduction of agriculture into Europe. Oh, this, there we go, okay. Um, we see, first of all, expansion of, um, of settlement into um, Cyprus here. This is, a, is a, a diagram of the hypothetical expansion of agriculture out of the Near East Center. Um, it may be correct. I have my doubts about this one, but at, that might also be possible. We don't have enough data from Western Turkey to say that this is, this is real. Um, 
but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is most likely the sites that we have, early Neolithic sites in, in northern, uh, at North Africa, in particular Egypt, date to about uh, 8,000 years ago as, um, as populations again were expanding in this area. And um, it's a, clearly a Near Eastern assemblage of sheep, goat, wheat, barley, lentils, etc., that come out of these areas. Okay, and none of those plants or animals were native to Egypt, so they had to have been introduced at this time. We see, first of all, though, um, sites expanding in um, in Crete, uh, Cyprus, excuse me, uh, right here. Okay, and one of the important sites that we've has been excavated in, in Cyprus is this one. Um, going up this hill here, this is the site of Kirokatia in southern Cyprus, uh, excavated in the 50s by um, the Cypriot archaeologist uh, named Dikios. He excavated mostly this lower part of the village here, which in fact is a, is a, is a more recent part of the Neolithic village. Um, there's a large wall going up here. And in more recent years, a French team has been excavating up at the top of the hill and uncovering much earlier material, although we don't as yet have any carbon-14 dates from this material. It appears to be probably as early as, as um, uh, 8,500 to possibly 9,000 years ago. Uh, and I think when we do get radiocarbon dates, which we will, uh, within the next year or so, we'll find that, that it, it, it does date to about that time. 8,500 uh, to 8,000 years ago being the time here when we had this, this second collapse of, of settlement uh, in the Neolithic uh, Near East, okay, and, and people moving off easily accessible um, in Cyprus. You can see Cyprus from Lebanon and settling in, in um, this village of Kirokatia, uh, which kept expanding through time, as we now know from these earlier ex excavations. The earliest occupation so far uncovered, uh, the houses looked pretty much like this, made of mud brick here. You've got a, a, a number of courses of the mud brick wall preserved. Um, the stones on top here are from uh, a subsequent building that was built after this one was abandoned. Here's the doorway into this building. And you would have, in, on this side, a number of these, of these buildings, um, <coughs> thank you, pardon. A number of these buildings grouped together. Here's another little one over here. Um, there's another one over here. And um, all the doors facing out into what appears to be a little open area or a little courtyard between the buildings. This is similar to, to the situation you see in Africa in crawls, where a family build several structures, perhaps for several wives, um, with the open courtyard where all the wives get together and fight or make food or whatever wives do when they only have one husband. Um, and uh, within these areas between the houses, you have little installations like this. Um, this is one of these large grinding slabs, uh, a quern, uh, on which was ground the wheat and barley that these people were consuming. There were two of them, this big one here that's still in place, and another one that was sitting here that they had removed by the time this photograph was taken. Um, and several other large flat stones that might have been used to set the baskets of cereal on that they would remove the grain from and, and then grind it. Uh, and we found massive quantities of grain, all the Near Eastern assemblage, wheat, barley, oat, um, lentils, and sheep and goat on this site, all introduced uh, to the site. And this is some of the earliest occupation on the island. There, there is only one site that has any earlier pre-Neolithic occupation, and it appears to be a, a, a single purpose hunting site where the inhabitants were were visiting and uh, killing off a few pygmy hippos and elephants and then going away again. Um, this is what the site then looks like uh, in, during one of these early periods. All of these little round structures here, this is actually a diagram of a later period, um, with stone-built structures, uh, with interior um, walls or benches around them in some cases, interior hearths. Uh, some of them have interior pillars in them to hold up. Uh, there's one here, for example, 
a pillar to hold up perhaps a loft where they would store things. Um, these aren't very large houses. These early ones measure uh, two to three meters in diameter. Some of them as small as one meter in diameter. Um, perhaps not all used as living quarters, but some storage facilities, etc. Okay, so that's the typical um, early Neolithic kind of settlement that you get in, in Cyprus. And if we move then to Greece, further east, the earliest evidence we have of occupation in Europe, um, of Neolithic occupation in Europe, domesticated plants and animals, in other words, um, comes at about 8,000 years ago. Um, none of the sites so far excavated, and I have to say there have been precious few of these, only a, a handful, only about five uh, or so sites that have any kind of systematic excavation on them, um, date, all of them, the earliest levels date to around 8,000 years ago. So that this movement out of the Levant or perhaps out of Turkey at the same time and probably for the same reasons, um, resulted in, in populations um, settling in uh, northern Greece. The area we're looking at here is up in Thessaly, um, the large Thessalian plain right up here, uh, where you, as you wander across the plain, which is difficult to do because now it's all cultivated, you, you run across these little bumps in the landscape. These are mounds or magulas as they are called. This is a teensy one, probably a classical one. Some of them are, are, are very large and have occupation going from the early Neolithic from 8,000 years ago up through the classical period. Um, and they just dot the landscape. Many of them now have been destroyed as a result of increasing or intensification of, of agriculture um, and the natural for forces of erosion, etc. Um, but, the, but there are, so far, have been found through survey, um, nearly 500 of these, of these sites. Um, a substantial number of them, um, well over uh, 150 of them being, uh, having early Neolithic occupation on them. Um, we also have um, early Neolithic occupation in southern Greece in a few sites, and one of the more important ones in, in my opinion, uh, is Franci Cave here. This is the site I did my dissertation on. Um, and it's important primarily because it, um, it has a long period of occupation. It's like Abu Reira in Syria. It has pre-Neolithic and Neolithic occupation with a break between the two, okay? Not continuous occupation. This is the cave here. It's a large cave. It's about the size of a football field. Uh, from front to back and about 50 meters wide, and it's just above the modern shoreline, which is just off a slide down here, about 50 meters away. Oh, this is just another site in Thessaly, one of these large, low magulas there. This is inside the cave. Um, to give you an idea of, of size here, there's a person sitting down inside the trench there at a table. Um, this large trench here we'll look at next, it goes down 11 meters um, until we hit water, uh, groundwater. This trench goes down 13 meters um, and we hit rock at the bottom, not natural bedrock but roof fall. Um, the picture was taken from another roof fall, um, the huge boulders that the photographer was standing on here came from the roof that resulted in a complete collapse of part of the roof. So there's a window in the cave uh, nowadays that sep and the, the collapse separates the front one third of the cave from the back two thirds of the cave. Um, so we could only excavate this front part. There's more roof fall out here. It's a very unstable area. It wasn't um, it was a little nerve wracking digging in here once the geologist told us that it was a, it was a very unstable cave. Uh, it was pretty evident from all of the roof fall around it. Now, uh, in addition to the, the Neolithic Near Eastern assemblage of um, domesticated wheats and lentils and other legumes and sheep and goat, which appear at 8,000 years ago at this site, um, we also have this kind of material which shows up earlier. Uh, this is obsidian, a volcanic glass from one of the Aegean Islands, the island of Milos, which is about 150 kilometers away. And um, it, as I say, occurs earlier in the cave at about 10,000 years ago. And 
the Mesolithic occupants of the cave or, or someone with whom they had contact was going out to Milos in a boat, um, probably island hopping out there and back, bringing back the obsidian. In the Neolithic period, by 8,000 years ago, this becomes um, about 70% of the material that is used to make stone tools. So it's gone from maybe 10% in the Mesolithic period to 70%, a substantial leap, which means there's, there's either a lot of trade interaction or, or there are people um, from Franqui who are in the business of going back and forth or whatever. But it becomes an important commodity at this time in the early Neolithic, and it shows that there was a lot of movement within the Aegean Sea, which is important if we're going to talk about people coming from the Near East, bringing, um, bringing their Near Eastern assemblage of plants and animals and their lifestyle of settled village life. Um, they're going to be coming through the islands and, uh, and exploiting these kinds of resources on the way. This slide here just looks down that very large uh, 11 meter deep trench in, this, uh, in the previous slide. Um, Neolithic occupation here, getting down to Mesolithic occupation layers, and then down way at the bottom, Paleolithic occupation layers. The deepest layers go down to sometime around 30 to 35,000 years ago. And the occupation ended in the cave sometime around 3,000 years ago. So it's a long, not unbroken, sequence. There are periods of hiatus, periods of abandonment of the cave, certainly. Um, one of the things that shows up, interestingly enough, in the earliest deposits in all of these sites is pottery. Uh, and there's still a question as to whether or not there's, a, there's an aceramic period, as we saw in Cyprus, as we have in the Near East, a long period of domestication of um, Neolithic culture, but no pottery. They were using stone and baskets, etc., cetera, um, for containers. The earliest Neolithic we have in Greece almost always shows up with pottery, and there are a few sites where too little has been excavated to be certain. Um, this is the early Neolithic kind of pottery that shows up. These two large baggy bowls and little, little ones like this. The rest of this is, is later Neolithic, and we don't need to go into that. But it's a relatively simple pottery, but it's clearly well-developed pottery. These are not experimental pots. It wasn't developed here at Franckley. It was introduced. And it was introduced at the same time that the plants and animals were, which suggests that it had to have been brought in with them. Although it is made with local clays, um, the technique was brought in. These people weren't experimenting with how to make pots. Um, so we have the introduction into Europe at about 8,000 years ago of a fully Near Eastern assemblage of plants and animals and the full Near Eastern culture. Um, and I will just leave you with one problem. We won't go into, I think it's getting a little, uh, a little late at this stage in the game. Um, we won't go into the whole problem of the development of our boar culture, olive domestication, grape domestication. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions on that, but um, uh, let me just finish with this one problem. If, if we have um, uh, no aceramic Neolithic in Greece, we have a fully developed Neolithic culture with a Near Eastern assemblage of plants and animals. Um, our next problem to solve then is where exactly did these people come from? We can't connect artifacts like, like the pottery or, or other kinds of artifacts from the sites directly to any one place in the Near East. We can't yet connect um, the plants specifically to any one place, the Levant or, or Turkey um, or, or anywhere else in the Near East. The plant assemblage is a Near Eastern assemblage and it shows up in the Near East at the same time all over the place. Um, except for one species of plant, and this is the one that we need to look for, uh, and that's the wild, or the, the domesticated rye that I mentioned earlier on. It only occurs in northern Syria and Anatolia. It is native in wild form to those areas. It does not occur to the south. Um, and if, if populations were coming from Anatolia, for example, from western Anatolia across the Aegean or up through Macedonia, um, bringing their Near Eastern assemblage with them, we would expect to find 
domesticated rye in this assemblage. And so that's, that's my next problem, is to excavate a site sufficiently, and this has never been done in northern Greece yet, uh, to and systematically to collect the plant remains from the site to see if we can find some of these um, identifying plants, uh, the wild, the domesticated rye in particular, um, but there may be others that we as yet don't know about. So there are still more problems to be solved, um, which will keep me employed for a while longer, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Um, there are many more problems to solve than I can solve, and there are not enough people uh, who do this kind of work in this area. Um, so if, if any of you happen to be interested in this kind of study, whether you're a botanist or uh, an agriculturalist or uh, um, an archaeologist, uh, this, this is one area where there's a, a great deal of, of room for, for development and more questions to be answered by all of the different disciplines that are involved in these kinds of studies. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Yes? The process you describe that seems to take place in the Middle East where um, nomadic foragers become sedentary foragers and then settle down into agriculture, does that take place in other parts of the world where agriculture <coughs> develops, such as China or America? Apparently, it does. We're seeing China <coughs> and the Southeast Asia in general, <coughs> excuse me, is still in the early stages of being explored in this respect, but <coughs> um, we're beginning to see the same kinds of processes um, where we have those, those areas that have been well enough surveyed so that we can get a picture of settlement patterns in pre-Neolithic times, pre-domestication times. Um, we're getting, we're getting something of the same kind of pattern with, with larger um, apparently settled sites or at least larger base camps that are occupied for longer periods of time um, prior to the domestication so that, so that sedentism does seem to be something of a prerequisite here for, for domestication. Um, we also see the same thing, for example, in South America in the sites that have been studied in Peru uh, and um, to some extent in Mesoamerica as well, although I'm not as familiar with that material, I have to say, as, as I am with other, other areas. Yeah. Fishing is an interesting problem in general. Um, there was a theory um, at one point, and it, it is still a perfectly valid uh, theory with some support, that at this period of the close of the Pleistocene, um, as we have an expansion of these resources, um, we have uh, a, a diversification in resource exploitation, so that not only were they exploiting the larger animals that they had been hunting and some of the wild plant resources, but they did tend to move toward the coast. We tend to find more coastal sites during this period, during the Mesolithic. This is certainly true in Europe. Um, it, it, it may be true in the Near East. The problem is that, um, well, it's the problem all over Europe, uh, all around the Mediterranean at least, is that the coastal sites are now underwater for the most part. With sea level rise, um, we've lost much of the Mesolithic population. This may have happened, what it may have be what happened to the population in northern Greece. There's no Mesolithic population in northern Greece to be able to say whether they were coastal or not. I mean, they might have been coastal and now they're underwater. Um, but that seems unlikely because not everybody was living on the coast. Certainly, the coast is more exploited, and with Franci material, certainly the coast was more exploited at this time. Um, so in some areas, yes, that does seem to be the case. With the Near East, I wouldn't say that, that, that there's any direct connection between exploitation of fish and domestication of, of plants or animals. Um, I think fish just became, 
another resource as sea levels rose, um, those people who had been inland now found themselves on the beach. Uh, this was over a long period of time, but, but sea, le sea levels brought with them coastal changes that made the coasts more attractive for a variety of resources, not just the fish that would show up, but the shellfish as well. So there probably was a movement toward the sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, the $64,000 question. Um, I think not. I think that other group was not there. The geologist who studied the sediments in the cave has said that there's a period of at least 500 years hiatus from, from the latest Mesolithic occupation we have to the er appearance of the earliest Neolithic. There's a, there's a discontinuity in the sediments at that point, which appears to, to mean that there was a period of no sedimentation, no deposition, which means that there was no occupation. Does that mean that these groups that were cultivating plants were going into, into places that weren't occupied? I think so, okay. yeah. What happened to the Mesolithic people, again, it, one has to address this question. Um, the, the Mesolithic population of Franckley, if, if, if you look at the survey data from, from around this region, there are a couple of other Mesolithic sites in the area. Um, and there's a, another one further north, but um, there's, no, there's no dense occupation. Um, and there, the Mesolithic populations in northern Greece, well, there isn't any in Thessaly. There's none in Macedonia. There's some in, in western Greece um, that, that hang on and remain Mesolithic while the rest of Greece is becoming Neolithic. So they, they're hangers on it. And this happens in, in Europe as well, where you get Neolithic populations coming in in one part and exploiting lowland arable areas while Mesolithic populations are living up in the mountains and continuing their Mesolithic way of life for a very short period of time. It only probably lasts several hundred years until the Mesolithic population adopts um, agriculture, excuse me. Um, but at Franchthi, um, which is the only site that's been excavated so far in Greece that has a Mesolithic occupation followed by a Neolithic occupation. There's no other site so far that we found in Greece with this kind of deposition. Um, we have this hiatus, so it, it would appear that at least the site was abandoned and these people went off. I don't know where they went. They went into the water. They drowned like lemmings. Um, they don't know. Any other questions? Yeah. These writings that were collected and, and ultimately cultivated, um, does the physical evidence allow us to figure out how they were prepared and served? No, it doesn't really. Um, we can make guesses based on, on the kinds of tools they have. These big grinding slabs would, would suggest that they were grinding the grain. Um, we have no remains of anything like bread, for example. Um, in the, the earliest sites in the Near East, we have no pottery, and we have, therefore have no residues in pots or anything like that. Um, my guess is, and I have to say it's only a guess, um, is that they were probably grinding some of the grain into flour and making flat bread as they have done for thousands of years and are still doing today, pita. Uh, bread. Uh, and um, some of it they may well have been just cracking and boiling, making bulgur and, and other kinds of, of... These pots you're showing look like things you could serve beer in. Uh, could they have been fermenting these grains? They could have. Sure they could have. Um, again, we don't have any evidence for that directly, but that's certainly possible. That would have been a powerful incentive to settle down and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, settled on the, the original couch potatoes with their cans of beer and no television set. Um, yes, they could have. They could have been making beer in these. These are not terribly large pots here. Um, really, the the largest the largest Neolithic one is this this one here um, is only about this big. So it's it's not. We're not talking about the kinds of things that you find, for example, in Mesoamerica. These big beer boiling. Um, pots, but um, there's nothing to say that they couldn't have made beer 
Um, we don't have any direct evidence for beer um, until we have written evidence from Egypt, and that doesn't come in until about 3000 BC. So we don't. Where does Lebanon come from? Uh, well, in order to make the bread rise, you need um, a, a different kind of wheat than we have early on. You need bread wheat. That begins to show up around 6000 BC, fairly early on, really, in the periods of domestication. Uh, and, but it doesn't catch on until the Bronze Age, really, not until after 3000 BC. So we don't know when real leavened bread is made. Um, there's no mention of leavened bread in the earliest writings in the Near East, as far as I know. Um, so even though they had this bread, um, they may have been, it, it may have risen just because of yeast in the area, uh, in the air, I mean. Um, so it might have risen naturally. Um, but there's no deliberate leavening of bread, as far as I know, uh, early on. It comes in, um, I think by the classical period, and after that. Manuel. I was really struck by your statement that it takes as little as one human generation to domesticate a stack of wild plants. Do you anticipate it's ever going to be possible to see that it happened in one spot and spread outward or simultaneously? Um, I'm thinking of theories, for example, um, sort of along those lines related to the development of the European languages. Did it start in one place and spread out? Or was there spontaneous generation? Um, well, yeah, that's a hard question to answer, really. I, mean, I don't have an answer to that. I'll make one up. Um, the data, the studies that are being done now, and there are a number of studies being done um, both in England and in southern France with experimental farms, first of all, to make sure how long does this take, OK? They've, they've taken the wild plants, and they've been cultivating them and harvesting them in the way with with the prehistoric tools that they find on these early sites um, and in the ways that they think would have been done. And they're actually using a number of different methods to see which one results in the domestication. So we don't know for sure that it only takes 20 years, but all of the data points to this. Um, and there was, at one point, a computer program that a botanist in, in Wales developed to, to test this theory on the computer, um, and it supported it. Okay, so we got 20 years here. Are we ever going to be able to see this on an archaeological site? Well, no. Um, what we're going to see, if we ever find a site where we don't have this hiatus between, between the Mesolithic and the Neolithic, um, if we have a site that is continually occupied from which we have plant remains that are in good condition and abundant enough, what we're going to see is all wild cereals, for example, um, and then um, all domesticated cereals. And there's going to be a, an abrupt, a very abrupt change, um, which some would suggest, well, that's what we're seeing now, for example, at Franchi. Um, we've got the wild cereals, except we don't have wild wheat at, at Franklin. We do have wild barley at Franklin. And then, wham, we've got domesticated barley. But there we have geological evidence that says we have, we have, a, we have a hiatus there, a break in occupation. Um, but that's the kind of thing we have to see. I don't think we're going to see it at any one site and then, and then spreading out afterwards. Um, I think that domestication took place, this whole process of cultivation, harvesting, replanting, took place at a number of different sites throughout the Near East. Um, it took place using only one specific subspecies of these different plants that have been identified, but these plants occurred in enough places that it, it had to have happened um, in, in a number of places simultaneously. These people were not ignorant of each other's, of doing of what everyone else was doing, so there was enough communication. That, uh, that it happened very rapidly. And then it spreads to the east and to the west, um, fairly rapidly, actually. Probably within, a, within the space of, of 100 years or so, we're, we're having major populations in, in, certainly in Cyprus and then in, in Greece and the islands.
well, not the islands, in Crete and in mainland Greece. The islands are not occupied until much later. Yes? Are there any human remains in any of these sites that can be used to determine the dietary health? Yes, now there's an interesting question as well. Not enough, I could tell you that. Um, some of this stuff study has been done because one of the questions that, that paleonutritionists along with archaeologists have been asking is what, what effect did domestication have on the population, uh, on, their, um, on their health for one thing, um, and can we see the change from, from pre-domestication to domestication in human bone remains. Um, and uh, one person who did a study on some Mesolithic um, individuals in the Near East, uh, Margaret Schoeninger, who's at the University of Wisconsin now, um, studied human remains from a number of Mesolithic sites and several Neolithic sites in the Near East. And her conclusions were that she could see no change in diet, basically, in the quantity of plant foods these people ate during the Mesolithic period compared to the plant foods they ate in the Neolithic period. Um, and this isn't surprising. Now that we're getting more botanical material out of the Mesolithic sites, we're seeing the full range of types of plants, cereals, legumes and a wide variety of fruits and nuts being exploited in the Mesolithic uh, and the same kinds of things being exploited in the Neolithic, although not quite as wide a range. In fact, the quantity of plant foods that they ate or the, the diversity of plant foods they ate in the Neolithic is much less than it was in the previous period. So their diet actually um, changes for the worse in some cases because they don't have the diversity. Uh, and along with domestication, the other thing the physical anthropologists are discovering is that um, these people were, um, they worked much harder in the Neolithic period. The, the stress on bones um, is much more prevalent in the Neolithic, uh, especially on women compared to the Mesolithic uh, skeletal remains. We don't have vast quantities of Mesolithic skeletons, I have to say or Neolithic ones for that matter, but we have enough now that studies have shown that there is a significant um, uh, change in, in stress uh, amongst these populations. The same thing has been found amongst Native American populations when corn agriculture is introduced into North America. Um, the, the whole quality of, of their, um, their life, their health, decreases with the advent of agriculture. So um, these are different kinds of changes that are being, still being studied. We need more skeletal material from the Near East to, to really examine this. Yeah? If agriculture started because uh, the climate was getting worse and people were hungrier, um, there must have been other times where human populations experienced worsening in the environment than scarcity, and then didn't start agriculture. I know. Uh, this is another, another one of those problems that uh, you just wonder, well, why not? Why didn't they? They had, um, some people have said, well, the, the specific domesticatable plants and animals weren't available in those earlier periods. So certainly throughout the Pleistocene, there were periods when uh, there were interglacials when conditions got better and the resources were available and then they got worse and resources were no longer available. Um, the, the major difference, as, at least as far as we can tell from looking at settlement patterns and um, estimating population size, is that during these earlier periods, the population was small enough and the, and the social organization of these populations was such, in small groups, small bands, that um, when conditions got worse, they simply moved to another area and where they could continue to exploit the resources that they were used to exploiting. Um, we didn't have, we don't have any evidence for settlement, for settled populations, and that does seem to be a, a uh, significant requirement 
for uh, A, population expansion, uh, and B, um, ultimately domestication. The earlier populations when these conditions occurred didn't set, hadn't been settled. They hadn't, they were mobile, and they just remained mobile, and they got more mobile, and, and just moved away and moved into, into better conditions. The other question nobody's asked, which is the obvious one, is why did they do it in the first place? I mean, why, um, well, I've sort of answered that question, uh, but, the, but the, the classic question that everyone asks is you've got these ideal conditions in the Mesolithic with all of these abundant uh, resources. Um, and we see this in, in Europe as well, um, the Mesolithic populations with abundant resources that didn't, where we don't see severe degradation as a result of drought. We don't see severe problems with overpopulation in the Mesolithic period like we do in the Near East. And yet these people who had other kinds of resources didn't take up agriculture either. Um, and yet they were settled uh, populations. And I think uh, one of the reasons there is, um, is because uh, they were able to diversify their their exploitation of the environment sufficiently, which goes back to the question about fishing, um, exploitation of the coastal um, uh, areas more, um, uh, greater areas of, of woodland that they could move into and exploit in some cases um, that they they simply didn't they didn't need to um, expand their their resources artificially. And some of these questions are questions that we just we don't have the answers to these things. We need more research. We need more data. Yeah. I have, I have one question. Did I understand you when you said that food animals were domesticated after the plants seem to have been? Oh, no, not quite. Um, the, the animals were probably domesticated about the same time as plants were, but the plants were apparently domesticated in the Levant, whereas the animals were apparently domesticated in the Zagros Mountains as nearly as we can tell at the moment from, we haven't been able to do much excavation in Iraq and Iran in recent years, so it's hard to tell. Um, and the sites that we do have were excavated fairly early on when the data collection methods were not ideal. Um, so we might never be able to answer those questions exactly, but, but the data we have now appears to, to say that sometime by 10,000, 9,500 years ago, plants that were domesticated in the, near, in the Levant and animals were domesticated in, in, in the Zagros. And we can, in a couple of cases, show sort of a progression of animals around the Zagros Taurus arc. And by certainly 8,500 or so uh, years ago, they were in the Levant because we, we have evidence for them in the Levant. They don't show up as domesticates as early in the Levant as they do, as, as domesticated plants do. 